bless all of you who joined us tonight. First of all, I would like to make it very clear that this event has nothing to do with 14th of February. It was just that we were trying to have Imam Umar Suleiman come in from last seven months, and subhanAllah, that was the only day that he was available <laughs> <coughs> to come all the way from Texas. We would like to thank you. Jazakallah khair for coming in. Imam Umar Suleiman is a kind-hearted, friendly brother. <laughs> Okay. 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 Prophet Wasallam said, Verily, I was filled with love of her. I repeat, Verily, I was filled with love of her. And he is actually talking about his, about his wife. That's how expressive Prophet Wasallam was when it comes to love for his wives. Inshallah, to enlighten us more about this topic, Imam Umar, Umar Suleiman will be telling us about relationships between men and women, Love at first sight, Re relationship before marriage, and martial rights, marital rights. I will request Imam so uh, Umar Suleiman to continue with the lecture, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How many of you took uh, the behind the scenes class, Qabiyat Nurain? Alhamdulillah. Welcome back. It's good to see you all again. Um, alhamdulillah, I was really, really, really excited to come back because I really did miss that class, and um, so I'm just going to I'm going to consider this an extension of that class. I'm just going to walk around, and I'm going to interact with you guys. I don't see. I, I don't feel comfortable sitting behind the table and talking. It's extremely strange. It's almost as strange as hearing my intro. Um, <laughs> my, you know, the kind-hearted, friendly giant. Um, I still don't get it. If you guys can send a letter to a mother, we just let them know that I'm not happy with that bio. I've told them that many times, but they think I'm being humble. I just think it's corny. Um, uh, you know, this topic is one that, obviously, I can't cover the entire topic of marriage or the entire spectrum of marriage and just... Actually, I couldn't even cover it over an entire day. Um, so what I'll try to do is I want you guys to, to answer my questions as we go along. I want you to interact. I want... And by the way, I want to have an extensive Q&A session at the end. Um, typically, whenever we have these topics, it's, you know, it's me lecturing um, you know, an audience about how marriage is supposed to be and things of that sort. And there are a lot of questions, especially about the practicality aspect of things. And we don't have time for that. Um, so this time, inshallah ta'ala, what I want to do is I want to leave you know, an extensive amount of time. And I hope you guys will actually ask questions and be direct about those questions you know, and about those issues that we face. So that we can properly address them in light, you know, in light of a snap. Now, there are two ways of approaching this, and either we could talk about how you should get married, or you know, and, and what you should look for in a spouse, and things of that sort, or we're talking about marital rights and, and how the relationship between the spouses should be. Now, as far as how the relationship between the spouses should be, I really, can't, I'm, you know, I don't have time to really elaborate on that. I don't think it's, uh, you know. I do think it's important, but I think it'll be more relevant to this crowd, at least, to talk more about what to look for before marriage, the, the marriage process in Islam, the entire concept, the institution, and it's completely related to the way that the relationship is supposed to be, because you look for certain things so that your marriage will be in a certain way. Okay, so we, we see those things manifest themselves, especially in the marriage of the Prophet wasallam. Can all of you guys hear me in the back? Everyone hears me clearly, loud and clearly, because there's no mic. You fixing the mic? Okay, we're not fixing the mic. Right. I just talked behind the scenes in Houston, so I lost my voice and I got it back yesterday, alhamdulillah. So I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't go out halfway. But um, in essence, you know, we're, we're um, you know, when we talk about this subject, it's a very testy subject, but does anyone know what the divorce rate is here in this country? In the United States right now? 40, 60. It's actually it's actually at 54%. Okay? That means that more than likely, you know, as Americans when we get married, when we walk down the aisle to get married, more than likely 
we're actually going to be in a battle, you know, in, in some battle of custody or whatever it is, or over assets before the end of our lives. More than likely, it's going to result in a divorce. And this is this has actually been the trend for the last four years now. Um, it's a consistent trend over the last four years that the divorce rate has actually gone over 50 percent, and it's and it's only getting higher and higher and higher and higher. All right, and and if you if there is you know even without if, even if we don't take the higher divorce rate, obviously the lack of happiness and the lack of you know compatibility that we see in marriages today. Now within the Muslim community, a lot of times when we when we talk about the Muslim community, we do one of two things: either we take the Muslim community and we act like the Muslim community is exempt from all of the problems that society has, right? Or we act like the Muslim community has it worse than everybody else. But in truth, the Muslim community is just as bad as everybody else with these things. Okay, we do have, we probably have a lower divorce rate, but at the same time, part of the reason for that is because of the, you know, the cultural pressure on spouses, you know, to stay together for the sake of preserving face, you know, for the sake of, you know, children and things of that sort. But I definitely say, you know, happiness in marriages and things of that sort definitely don't exist the way that they should. You know, especially coming from an Islamic context. And when we look at the seed of the Prophet and the biography and the, and the example that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him uh, laid out for us. Now, I'm, I want to have a very frank discussion about this topic because another thing that we tend to do is we tend to, you know, so you get asked this question all the time. If you don't date, does that mean you believe in arranged marriages? Okay? Does, does that mean that you are forced to marry your spouse? Okay, so it's an actual clash of culture. It's an actual clash of civilization, if you will, in the sense that, you know, there's one school of thought that you fall in love, okay, that you, you get together, you spend time with each other, you spend, you know, months, years, weeks, whatever it is, and then you fall in love, and then you get married, right? And there are actually two articles. I'm going to actually pull out my phone. There are two articles that came out this last week. Um, one of them... One of them uh, was on BBC, and the title of the article was, um, Is Romantic Love a Myth? Is Romantic Love a Myth? Okay, so that's the title of the article that was on BBC. Um, and in essence, it's talking about you know, all, of, all the various studies that, that have been done from a sociological perspective, that marriages that are based upon years and years, or months and months, of relationship where intimacy has already been explored, okay, tend to fail, and this is this is proven through numerous studies, and in fact, uh, you know, the article, the author says, it's socially this idea is socially corrosive because it idealizes love, rather than understanding that love is made not found, love is made in the gritty ups and downs of being with someone who is as flawed as you. All right, I'm a, that's a very powerful quote. Uh, again, it is socially corrosive because it idealizes love rather than understanding that love is made, not found. Love is made in the gritty ups and downs of being with someone who is as flawed as you. So you've got this, you know, this idea, and there's actually another another article that um that was on CNN. I don't know if anyone saw this. Why traditional dating is dead. This was on the front page of CNN in the last few days. Did anybody read that article? Why traditional? You read it? Why traditional dating is dead. Okay, and you know, so you got, and, and obviously these articles come out around Valentine's, but it's it's interesting because in essence, you have large, con you have you have concepts that have already been introduced by Islam, you know, just with bigger words to represent those concepts to be ex to, to be expressed in a secular context, but it's the same thing, it's the same thing that Islam says. Now here's the problem, especially when you're talking about second generation Muslims whose parents perhaps came from another country, whose marriages are dictated more by culture than Islam, but because we're second generation, it all gets bunched up into being Islam. It all gets bunched up into being one thing. So for example, if your parents say to you, you know, I married your mom without even ever seeing her before. Right? And there's some, you know, like, I married your mom and I never saw her before. I married your dad and I never saw, saw him before. And so you think that that's Islam. And it just really scares the you know, <laughs> out of you, and then you you know, so it just it just scares you. Like, what are you talking about? That that's the way that you really really make your kids fear is you know fear is that like you know, this is how you're supposed to get married, and that is a totally 100% arranged marriage, right? And so there's this idea that it's either this or it's either that, 
And what we fail to realize and recognize is that our deen is right in the middle. It gives you the perfect, um, it gives you the perfect equation. And obviously, I'm, you know, I, you know, someone might say who's not Muslim that he's being biased because he's Muslim. You're absolutely right. And I'm willing to have that discussion. I think we should, we should be willing to have that discussion. Obviously, I'm going to present what my faith deems to be true. Uh, but there is an attack on the Islamic way of life. There is an attack on the Islamic concept of marriage. Much of that is because of Islamophobia. Much of that is because it's been portrayed to be barbaric. It's been portrayed to be forced marriages, right? And although in some cultures that is the case, that has nothing to do with Islam. Um, and, I, and I give this example. Do you guys remember the um, Aisha Khan uh, you know, fiasco that was in New Jersey where uh, you had the sister that wore hijab that you know, was... Okay, Sorry to interrupt all of you, but most of you people are parked in A and B parking lots without the parking sticker. So I will request it's a seventy-five dollars ticket if you care. You can park in the meter parking or the street parking. Inshallah. <laughs> Is anybody who, who's parked in A and B parking? A and B or C, actually. So nobody made that mistake. The meter is okay. Because <laughs> if like half the room is going to get up, then I'm just going to stop looking. <laughs> What's that? The garage. Is the garage okay? The garage is not okay? The garage is not okay, garage is not okay if you don't have the parking sticker. So the only thing that the uh, only place you can park is meter parking and uh, street parking. If you don't have a parking ticket. So where was I? What was I talking about snow? Alright, so let's get back to it, inshallah. Back to the discussion. Everybody remembers what happened with Aisha Khan. You had a sister that was you know, that that, that called her brother and, and was you know, it, it gave off the impression that she was abducted, it caused a huge stir in the Muslim community. Um, you know, people were posting all over social networking about how to hurry up and find her, how, what, what we can do to help the family. And I remember, you guys all know Nancy Grace, right? Yeah. Nancy Grace. So Nancy Grace, me personally, I'm, I'm, I, she irritates me to be honest with you, but aside from that, you know, she was doing this interview with her, her brother, Aisha Khan's brother. And um, in that interview, you know, she's, she's asking him, you know, and, and obviously we know that the story did not turn out to be as it appeared to be, but she's asking him, on the assumption that that he is a grieving brother that's looking for his sister right now, instead of, you know, offering support and offering help, she starts to interrogate him. And what does she say to him? Was this a forced marriage? In fact, was your marriage an arranged marriage? And, uh, and she said, because here in America we get married because of love. Right? She's going off on him about that. And it's like, if, he did, if I just lost my sister, that's not what I want to talk about right now. And the poor guy is forced to defend himself and say, you know, uh, you know I, I, I met my wife a few times before, and she's digging into the details, right, of his marriage. I'm like, how did you get married anyway? Because that's not how we do things over here. And it was terrible. So what we have to understand is that our way of life is being attacked. Right? It's being scrutinized, it's being called backwards. Right? And, and subhanAllah, a lot of times, again, when you have people that are skilled in their fields, when you have, when you have sociologists and you have you know, uh, people coming out with these studies that are saying that the way that we approach love in this society as Americans is, not, is actually not conducive to happy marriages. Right? You know, it's, no one calls that backwards. No one calls that backwards. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means from an Islamic perspective to get married, what you should look for. Number one, and some of you that took behind the scenes of the class me, you know, you're going to see some, I'm going to repeat a few things that I said, especially on, on the topic of character, all right, when we talk about character. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, he said that you look for two things in a marriage. You look for what? <coughs> what do you look for? You guys already forgot? Religion and character. Religion and character. That if someone comes to you that is pleasing to you in character and religion, then marry that person. And if you don't do so, then there will be widespread corruption. And there will be widespread, there will be widespread tribulation. All right, so these are the two things that we're supposed to be looking for. These are the primary things that we should be looking for. Why? 
Can a person have religion and not have character? Yes. 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 Can a person have character and not religion? Yes. 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 All right. So you've got you, you've got one of those two things, and, and I see it all the time. You know. So for example, you and, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi always put these two together. He never mentioned one without mentioning the other. Okay. They go hand in hand. You see many people that are that 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 wear the garb of religiosity, but they're rude, violent tempers. Okay. They won't even hold the door for anybody at your university or whatever it is. Right? You know, they don't have any form of good character. All right? So that's a person that you should actually avoid because the religion to that person might be dangerous, actually, because they might use the religion to justify their illness in character, okay, or their lack of character. They, they might actually use the religion to manipulate because character is the controlling, it's, it's, the, it's the balancing variable in this equation. Right? It balances out religion here. By having character, you balance out religion. And by having religion, you balance out character. Why? Because if a person just has good character, their standard of good morality and good character would consistently be altered by time and place. Right? What's considered goodness today and what's considered moral today was not considered moral and was not considered good 20 years ago. Right? And, uh, and culture can be very hypocritical. It really can, and this is across the board. If you look across cultures all over, you know, all over the world, you can always identify. You can point out hypocrisy in our cultures. Okay, every culture has its its own share of hypocrisy. Okay, and its own share of, of just you know senselessness. All right. So, for example, you know what was what would have been considered modesty? How many of you guys used to watch? Uh, well, not used to watch. You guys, have you guys ever seen those shows like I Love Lucy and yeah. and All in the Family, yeah. right? And those types of shows. Like, did you used to see the type of stuff that you see now? Uh, no. no. Uh, Dick Van Dyke. You guys remember Dick Van Dyke? No one remembers Dick Van Dyke. But you've heard of Dick Van Dyke, right? Or you might have seen Dick Van Dyke. They used to actually show in the show uh, he'd be sleeping in a separate bed as his wife on the show. Because it was considered lewd to portray the husband and the wife on TV sleeping in the same bed. That's without any form of, you know, that's without any form of expression or things of that sort. Just, just for them to be in the same bed would allow, would, would, uh, would be too much for the masses to handle. Now, wouldn't you say that that's changed? Right? Now, um, you know, you look at Super Bowl commercials, right? I, I didn't watch Super Bowl commercials, alhamdulillah, but I saw all the responses of people that did watch Super Bowl commercials. Especially, and, you know, the GoDaddy commercials and stuff like that, right? And it's seriously, it's like you've got families sitting around the TV watching porn. It's terrible. But that's, that's, in essence, that's what's happening. Now, to some people, that's free expression. It wouldn't have been considered free expression 30, 40 years ago. Right? To some people, that's none of your business. It is your business because you're putting that garbage in my living room. Right? But again, the standards of morality change. Okay, the standards of morality change all around the world. Okay, it's, it's just, it doesn't, you know, morality is always biased and tempered by, by time and place. All right? So you need to have religion, something that's constant, to sort of govern that morality, to govern that character. All right? Otherwise, these two, these two things can actually become dangerous. All right? They can actually become dangerous. Now, Here's the thing. How do you determine good character? How do you determine good character? I told you guys it's going to be interactive. <clears throat> I'm not going to lecture you for two hours. I'm tired. <laughs> right. How do you determine good character? Personality. Personality is one way. Yeah. How they treat others. How they treat others. Great. All right. What else? What's that? Your behavior. Behavior. Great. All right. What else? These are all correct answers, by the way. What else? Manners. That's more religion, but obviously, how much they would they would follow the Prophet's life. And obviously, that's practice. practice, like in terms of mannerisms, right? That's the same. Yeah. Uh, how they act on their family? They can be nice on other people when they're on their family. Great. Great. How they treat their family members? Okay. What else? How do they talk with others? How do they what? How they talk with others? How they talk with others? What else? How they act when no one's there. How they act when no one's there? Well, how would you know that? <laughs> <laughs> what else? How they treat others who are 
are lower in status? How they treat others who are lower than status. All of these are correct answers. All of these determine in some way, shape, or form character. Now, for those of you that, were, that, that took the class that I taught a few weeks ago, we talked about the meaning of the word khuru, the, the meaning of the word character in Islam. And what does it in essence mean? What did we say that it means? You guys are going to fail these, these exams. <laughs> Inner beauty? Inner beauty, right? Inner beauty. Allahumma kama ahsanta khalqi ahsan khuluqi. The Prophet sallallahu he said that he used to make the dua and taught us to supplicate and say, Oh Allah, as you made my outside beautiful, make my inside beautiful. So the actual word for internal beauty is khuluq. Okay, it's, it's the same word that's used for character. Now obviously, you don't really know what a person's like on the inside. You cannot, you know, you cannot determine for sure what a person is like on the inside. Now, now character, you know, in essence, isn't what's going to, what's going to keep a, 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 a relationship going. And in essence, that was that article on traditional dating, what, what's going to keep a, rela a relationship going is common purpose, common purpose, common purpose, and good treatment. Okay, treatment of one another. And in that realm of treatment, you've got understanding of those types of things. So this is in essence, again, what the Prophet Muhammad was saying, which is religion and character. Now, how would you, you know, so if, if, how can you determine internal beauty? That's the thing. In essence, what the Prophet is, is telling us is that a person that does not treat other people well, that is not good to their families, that belittles those that are lower than, than them, that does not show common courtesy, is not a person who is, beautifully, who is beautiful internally. There is no way, right? And we, and we mentioned the example that Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he gave that, you know, your heart is like, is like a dish and your tongue is like the spoonful of that dish. All right? So if your tongue is sweet, there is a possibility that you could have a sweet tongue but an ugly inside, right? But there is no way possible that a person could have a beautiful inside and an ugly tongue doesn't exist in Islam. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, when he was asked about that woman who used to, you know, pray all the time, fast all the time, give charity all the time, the Prophet peace be upon him was asked, you know, about her. Why? Because she was also very abusive towards her neighbors. And the Prophet peace be upon him said she has no good inside of her. Right? Not only did, not only was it was it a declaration that her hereafter is not going to be reflected by salah and, and prayer and those types of things. But rather, she's devoid of good on the inside. The way that she acted, the way that she carried herself, was a direct indication that she was devoid of good on the inside. Because the character represents an ugly inside. An ugly inside. An ugly character represents an ugly inside. Now, here's the thing. Again, you cannot know for sure what a person is like. Now, in Islam, before you get married, are you supposed to ask other people about that person? Yes. 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 Okay, and in fact, you had, you know, you know, the woman who asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Muawiyah, not Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, I forget, I forgot Muawiyah ibn someone else, another, another person by the name Muawiyah, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he always carries a stick on his shoulder, don't do it, alright, he's going to abuse you, don't marry him, straight up, he told her do not marry him, because he's always going to carry a stick on his shoulder. All right. So again, which he didn't tell her, you know, you shouldn't be asking about a person. No, you should ask about a person. You should observe a person's character. You should observe their etiquette as much as you can, right? Even from a distance, and find ways to find out about their character, to ask about them. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Now, are there times? Are there times that you might ask about a person? You might get a good image. You might get a good response. You might see good, and then once you get married, you find out that that person is not who you thought they were? Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody's not having a good Valentine's Day. <laughs> but it happens. It happens. It does happen. And, though, you know, and, and that's why you cannot detach the element of faith from all of this. You cannot detach the element of faith from all of this. And there's two aspects of this. Number one, Obviously, it would happen much less if you took all of the precautions that you're supposed to take. And you married that person for the right reasons, it would happen a lot less. It still will happen. But isn't it easier to be manipulated and to end up in a marriage 
with someone who does not dis who does not have good character, if you are even looking for those, if you are ignoring the warning signs in favor of their physical appearance, in favor of you know this this romanticized infatuation, right? You're more likely to get into that situation then. And the other aspect of that is that you know, in, in essence, when, whenever you ask people in Islam, when you ask people about other people in a good way, not in a bad way, it's called istishara. Istishara, like shura. Right? So what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And you do it in a way, obviously, where you're not going to blow it up and make it public. Alright? You don't, you, you, try to, you try to keep it as, as low as possible. Alright? But at the same time, you ask people. And then, even when you ask people, it, some, it sometimes might turn out that the person is not to that level. So what else do you do? Istikhara. And istikhara is literally, you are asking God, you're asking Allah, if this is good for me, it's a prayer that you offer. If this is good for me, then make it happen, and if it's bad for me, then, prevent, then, then put obstacles between me and it. So it's like, I'm asking the only one who knows what the person is really like. And I'm sincere when I make that istikhara. Right? I'm sincere when I make that istikhara. I really want, and istikhara is very simple. You pray two rakahs, you pray two sets of prayer, and you read a prayer, right? That's from the sunnah, that's from the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, you know, asking, asking God to guide you to the right decision. Alright? You're not, decision. You're not gonna, you're not supposed to see a dream. Alright? You're not gonna see any colors. Alright? The tooth fairy is not going to show up on your pillow and put a note under your pillow. And I'm telling you, I have seen the worst, like, the, the, the worst innovations in, in theology come in this topic, like in this matter of istikhara, right? I, I know people that, that would put six pieces of paper under their pillow, write yes on three and no on three, <laughs> pray istikhara, go to sleep, and then, you know, pick out a sheet of paper, all kinds of stuff. It's weird, all right? It's weird stuff. The dream stuff is actually very common. How many of you have heard that you're supposed to see certain colors? <coughs> be honest, you've heard that, right? You're supposed to see certain colors. That's like every time people break the phone, they're like, so Sheikh Omar, like, you know, I went to sleep that night, and I didn't see any different colors. I just, I dreamt of, like, Willy Wonka and Tom <laughs> and I dreamt of, like, you know, a leprechaun on ice. I was like, I'm not, I wasn't seeing any colors. I don't know, what, the, what, what are these people talking about? Exactly. You're not supposed to see colors. It had nothing to do with colors. Because as human beings, we always want a clear-cut yes or no. In essence, we're not willing to trust God. Yes. Right? I want to know now. And even when some people come and ask me, should I pray istikhara? And istikhara is, if, if this is bad for me, I don't want it to happen. Right? You're asking God, you're telling God, you're putting your faith in God. If this is bad for me, I don't want it to happen. But here's the problem. Because the element of, elements of infatuation comes in, it's like, I want it to happen whether it's good or bad. And if it's bad, I'll just deal with the circumstances later. And that's a problem. So it's like some people have come to me seriously. I want to pray istikhara. You know, how do you pray istikhara? So when I show them the, the supplication of istikhara, the du'a of istikhara, it's like, yeah, but can I just ask Allah just to give her to me? <laughs> Whether she's good or bad, I just want her. I'll deal with it later. I just want her, okay? And that's the problem. And then what happens even when people do pray istikhara sometimes, they're not honest to their istikhara. Why? Because God puts obstacles right and left, and they still go forth with it. Right? It's like, how many more obstacles do you need? Your signs are all there. Just, just drop it. But no, you know, I need to have that one. And I'm going to say something that, you know, I, I, I really feel very, very strongly about. And I know a lot, of, a lot of Muslims disagree with me. Okay? It is better to be unmarried than to get into a bad marriage. Be patient. I don't care how patient you've got to be. It would be better for you to wait and to make the right decision than to hurry up into the wrong decision despite pressure from, from you know, your, your whatever, family or culture or whatever it is. Okay, it's better for you to wait. It's better for you. In essence, it's better for you to be single than to be married to someone who, for example, is, 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 is an abuser. How long can you wait? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. How long can you wait? I've got a lot of topics, and that's why I've got questions. Well, I'm, I'm your parents, so I'm You're, waiting. No, well, parents. <laughs> talking from the parents' perspective. <laughs> Usually parents 
want to wait too long. The kids are ready to get married, and the parents are just like, no, wait, 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 wait. So much Allah, maybe we got a different situation. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just shedding light on a few of these subjects because I feel like it's important. Again, Q and A is, is I, I'm waiting for Q and A. I, I think Q and A would be the most valuable part of this because you guys can ask your questions directly. But again, some people are not honest to their istikhara. All right. So you're looking for religion and character. Okay. Now, do the other things count? Do the other variables count? Should you be physically attracted to the person that you're going to marry? Yes. Yes. You should be physically attracted to the person that you're going to marry. Okay? There's no doubt about it. And in fact, it's very harmful if you marry someone that you are absolutely not physically attracted to. Now, here's the problem. Now, now, physical attraction, can it be enhanced? Can it be enhanced by spiritual attraction, and mental attraction, and emotional attraction? Yes, it can. It can be. If you love someone for their character, you will become more physically attracted to them. There's no doubt about it. But there should be a level of physical attraction. There's no doubt about it. All the scholars that have written on this topic before have said that. Why? Because they should help you protect yourself. Help you lower your gaze, help you protect yourself, help you have, you know, help you feel secure, content. Now the problem is obviously some people set the bar way too high. And part of that again is because of the of the society that we live in, and it's all over the world. I mean a global society. I don't I'm not I'm not going to uh, knock on the American culture, on you know, on, on American culture, and ignore all of the social ills that we have in quote unquote Muslim countries. Okay, but part of that is certainly because of pornography, because of you know the the, the nature of of the of the, uh, the nature of advertising and marketing as it is today, right? That everything's been fantasized. Okay, everything's been fantasized. So in essence, like people cannot be content in their marriages because she or he doesn't look like she or he on a computer screen. Alright? Or on a TV. I'm being very serious. Seri- like that's really a problem. You don't look like that. Alright? Even though that person is photoshopped and isn't real. Alright? You don't look like that person who's gone through seven hundred thousand dollars worth of surgery and who's still being photoshopped in magazines. Why don't you look like that person? I don't want to marry you. That's a problem. That's a problem. Okay? And it destroys marriages. It destroys the prospects of happy marriages. But still, in Islam, there should be a certain level of physical attraction. So is it allowed to see a person before you get married? Yes. In fact, it's sunnah. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, when someone came to him and, and said, that I want to marry this person, the Prophet Wasallam said, go look at her. <laughs> make sure that you make sure that, that person is someone that you want to get married. Now obviously looking at you know, looking does not mean spying, does not mean, you know, <laughs> does not mean like like trying to hack into her Facebook account <laughs> and do stuff like that. Alright? But looking, there should be a certain there should be a minimal level. Not minimal, minimal is not a good word here, but there should be a satisfactory level of physical attraction for both the man and for the woman. Is social status important? Status important? It is, but it's not, you know, and and social status is mistaken. When when I say social status, I'm not talking about like if someone is is like from a certain tribe or a certain family, and this person's from a certain tribe and a certain family. That's not what I'm talking about. That's that's backwards. That's that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, so for example, in the time of the Prophet we had a failed marriage between two illustrious companions. One of them was Zayd, the adopted son of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Zainab, radiallahu anha. Right? These two, Zainab, who used to, now were they both religious? Yes. Zayd was raised at the hand of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You know, he was, his character represented the character of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He used to pray all night. Zainab used to pray so much at night, she'd have a rope tied where when she got tired, she'd lean on that rope because of how much she prayed at night. And the marriage didn't work. Why? Because Zainab was used to a certain lifestyle. And Zayd was, you know, Zayd wasn't. <laughs> Zayd grew up in poverty. He grew up, you know, in a rough, you know, in a rough situation. Okay? Zainab, on the other hand, was from a very wealthy family. She wasn't materialistic. It's just he's used to a certain way of life. And that's just, that's a reality, by the way. And I'll give you an example. A lot of times, by the, what happens is that you'll have a religious guy, and you'll have a religious girl. Good character is there too, but 
the guy can barely support, you know, a dorm room, and this girl is going to come from like a 4,000 square foot, well, Texas is 4,000 square foot house, sorry. Um, here, over here, like a mansion is like 2,000 square feet, right? So, and you pay like, <laughs> I'll break the bank for that, right? I'm from Texas, you got big, 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 big houses for what you guys would pay for an apartment, you know? But <laughs> go from that to being pampered, right? To, to, to living a very, very simple, simple, spoiled lifestyle to this. And it causes problems. Now, it's not the defining factor of the marriage, but certainly, and it's correct, it, you know, it can be corrected. It can be corrected. But at the same time, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not the main thing that a person should look for. It is important, but it's not the main thing that a person should look for. Should race be considered? In marriage? How many of you think yes? How many of you think a cup, you know, uh, two people being of the same race would make marriage, would make life easier for a married couple? More successful. More successful. How many of you think that's not the case? How many of you think it's to the advantage of, of the married couple to be of different cultures and backgrounds? How many of you just don't know? <laughs> you know what's interesting? In the verses of the Quran that were recited, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ بَشَرٌ تَنْتَشِرُونَ And from Allah's signs is that He created you from dirt, He created you from dust, and now you are, you know, بَشَرٌ تَنْتَشِرُونَ You're a human being scattered all over the world, making a living, you know. In essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clarifying the source. That all of us come from the same source. The next verse is what? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And from his signs is that he created from you mates from amongst yourselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنْ لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Sakan is, you know, is literally, what does second mean in the Arabic language? It's like a house. You can find stability in one another. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Allah put, put between you compassion and mercy. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Verily, and that is a sign for those who, who contemplate. So, first Allah clarifies the source. Then Allah says that He created for His mates. Then what's the next ayah? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اِخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالِمِينَ And from His signs is the, diff, the variation, the, your variation in skin color and in tongue in language and in race. In essence, the variation of culture, the variation of race, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in that is a sign for who? Al-alimeen. What does alimeen mean? Not alimeen. Alimeen means everybody. Alimeen, people who have knowledge. In essence, people who are not ignorant. All right? Allah put the verse of marriage between two verses that condemn racism. And in fact, Allah says the difference in, uh, the differences in our races is actually a mercy and it's actually something that you know that, that that's been put there so that we could get to know one another so that we could enrich ourselves right to get to know one another to enrich ourselves you know what the beauty of that is and i'm telling you in my own experience the old you know marriages in which the husband and the wife are from different countries are from different backgrounds are from different races actually tend to be more successful unless the families are putting so much pressure on both of them that they break the marriage apart. But their difference in language, their difference in culture actually sparks interest, right? It actually allows them to grow together. Plus, it represents that what united them was pure. What brought them together in the first place was pure, okay? And you know what else? Children of biracial marriages have IQ levels that are significantly higher than children that are not from biracial marriages. This is a fact, by the way. Hybrid kids. It's called hybrids, right? <laughs> Hybrid children. They are so easy to teach Quran to, like that half Egyptian, half Pakistani kid. It's so easy to teach Quran to that kid. He just like soaks it all in. It's like, man, you're a genius, right? Why? Because kids that learn multiple languages, kids that are exposed to more culture, kids that are exposed to that stuff, they're actually further enriched. They're actually further enriched. You can read studies on this all, there is actually consensus right now, you know, in this field, that children of, of, in biracial marriages are actually enriched, they, they tend to have
big, they tend to have uh, better IQs, they tend to be more intelligent, they tend, you know, you, you might argue that they might be cuter too, a lot. <laughs> but in essence, it's a gift. Allah is telling us he, gave it to us, he gave it to us as a gift. He gave it to us as a gift. And it's so sad now that, that sometimes you find a man and a woman that are so compatible, but the only difference is race. And because of that, they're held apart. Right, because of that, they're held apart. Now, for some of that, we might, we might not re really be able to control that. But if you're looking, if you're in that situation, do not consider that. Seriously, don't consider. Don't consider. You know, we are, especially those of us who grew up in this country as, you know, as, as we, are, we are as American as can be, right? You don't have to sit there and think about the back home thing and, and those types of consequences. You are home, right? You don't have to sit there and think about, well, this back home and this back home, all right? So that shouldn't count. You know what else is, is really, really important is that the types of questions that we ask them before we get married. Are we allowed to sit and talk with one another? Are we allowed to sit and talk before marriage? Yes. yes. In fact, some of the scholars of the past, like Imam Ibn Qudam rahimahullah, argued it is encouraged. We should. You should sit and you should ask important questions. So you should get to know important, you know, the things that are important to the other person. You know, and, and you should get to, uh, you know, you should try to find common ground. You should get to know that person. You should see, you know, if, if the ingredients for a successful marriage are there. And I'll give you this example. You know, what's the first question that, 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 a, that a guy and a girl usually ask each other whenever they get to know one another? What's the first question? You know, you know it's funny. It, it might sound it might sound typical, but I've seen it happen many times. It's like, so what's your favorite color? <laughs> like that. It's like I am I, I'm pretty certain that what's going to cause your marriage to fall apart in, in ten years is not going to be that you disagree over what your favorite color was. All right, it has nothing to do with that. Right? It's not even important questions, right? So it's like, why? What are you talking about? All right. Now, so in Islam, we're, we're allowed to sit, we should, we should, so this is the concept of arranged marriages, arranged in the sense that you choose to pursue the possibility, the prospect of marriage with someone who first, at least from the outside, meets the qualifications of religion and character, and who is satisfactory to you in the ways that, you know, in the ways that we just mentioned. So it starts off that way so that you don't waste your time, basically, all right? And then once you sit together, you talk about what's important. All right? You talk about issues that are important to, to both of you. Okay? And you should be direct and you should be blunt. Okay? And you should talk about the things that would keep a marriage successful. So in Islam, this is this is not not only a lot, it's encouraged, especially in this time where there's there are a lot of weirdos out there. Alright? Seriously, especially now, nowadays. It's it's important. It really it really is important. And, and also, by the way, ask about, you know, I tell sisters this all the time, especially, ask about their views towards women, all right, and those types of things, you know, and, and brothers, you should also ask about, uh, you know, sisters' views towards men, although it's, it's more important for sisters to ask that question, because sometimes, again, uh, you know, a person that might have an overly conservative background might have a chauvinistic attitude, unfortunately, it's a reality that we deal with. You ask about those types of things, okay? Now, you don't have to interrogate the person. You don't have to scare the person away. You don't have to, like, you know, it doesn't have to be in that way. But no, we, we should get to know one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only forbade two things from us. Well, th three things. Now, one thing is general, which is anything that's inappropriate. Right? It should not get inappropriate. Now, Allah has forbidden that we touch one another. So we're not supposed to start touching. And what else has Allah forbidden? Being completely secluded. Now, khalwa here, I have to qualify that for a moment. The type of khalwa that's prohibited for, for a person, for two people getting to know one another, the type of seclusion that's prohibited is a type of seclusion which may arise, which may give way to something inappropriate. Okay? So, for example, you know, the most awkward thing in the world is whenever, you know, and this is more cultural, but I, you know, I, I, can, I can tell a lot of us are probably second generation here. If you go to meet someone, and like, you sit between your parents, and then the other person sits between their parents, and you're supposed to have a conversation. <laughs> That's weird, right? That is really, really, really weird. No, you're allowed to talk. 
you're allowed to have private conversation to a degree. To a degree. Okay, private conversation in the sense that it cannot get inappropriate where touching can start to happen, those types of things, but private conversation to where you can, you know, you can, you can ask comfortably the things that you want to ask, the things that are important to you. Those are the things that we're supposed to look for in marriage. Now, why do you think, why do you think that's more important or that's more successful? And I just, I quoted to you, I read two articles. I didn't read those two articles. I mentioned those two articles that have come out, and again, secular media about how the traditional approach, when I say traditional, I mean traditional in our, in our society is not working. Why? Because when people start off their relationship, touching, okay, being intimate with one another, all right, enjoying, enjoying those types of things with one another, what has happened now that can, that, can, that can actually complicate things for the future? What's actually happened? Now, that's a little extreme, but um, I guess that can happen. Can happen. <laughs> um, no, but the idea here is that should marriage, now we all agree that marriage is the most important decision that you're going to make after your religion, right? That's the most important decision you'll probably make in your life, right? Okay. Should marriage be a rational decision or should it be an emotional decision? It should be a rational decision. Okay? You don't want to make the most important decision of your life while you are irrational and while you're purely infatuated. It's a fact. All right? It's, it's, it's common sense. Okay? When you go on that emotional ride, all right, before even getting married, you know, and each person has been able to show you their best side and put up a front. Okay? When you go on that ride, and then you, tr you get married after that, in essence, you've made an emotional decision. If you've already developed an infatuation for the other person, you will make them out to be the most amazing people in the world. Okay, so for example, the Muslims, I always, it, it just blows me away. You know, like whenever someone comes and they, and they, they act like they're getting married for religion. Right? Because I'm the imam, so they gotta, they got to act like they're getting married for religion. So they come up to me like, yes, yes, yes. So religious, mashallah, and he's so religious, and it's like you see the other person, you know what the other person is, you're like, I'm not being judgmental or anything like that, but are you sure you pursue the other person on religion? Ah, oh, Sheikh, she's amazing, she prays five times a day. <laughs> it's kind of what Muslims are supposed to do, you know? You know? You know, one night I was talking to her on the phone, and she was reciting Surah Rahman to me. <laughs> There's like some weird stuff that comes out. Like I remember a guy telling me that we went out to. <laughs> I'll never forget this one. A guy told me that he took he took this girl out on a halal date. Well, it's a halal date. They went to a restaurant, and after that, they went to the alley of the restaurant and prayed Aisha together. All right. And like he's like we sat next to each other and we did tasbih on each other's hands. And I'm like, <laughs> are you sure you were talking about? <laughs> The idea here is that if you really want somebody, if you really, if you become infatuated, then you will make that person out to be the most amazing person in the world, right? You'll, in essence, you'll try to fool yourself. You'll try to fool your own rationale. Now, marriage should not be an entirely rational decision, because yes, there is chemistry. We do believe in chemistry, and the Prophet ﷺ acknowledged that there is love. That a person might just develop a love for somebody. We do believe in chemistry. Chemistry is, is, is something, you know, it's chemistry exists in Islam not just between husband and wife. But in fact, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that chemistry exists between people as a whole. He said that the souls are like conscripted soldiers, right? They, they combine, you know, souls that, 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 were, that had an affinity towards each other in the previous life, have an affinity towards each other in this life. And souls that, that didn't like each other in essence, that did not have an affinity to each other in the previous life, you know, they're, they're turned off by each other in this life too, all right? So if, 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 you, if you naturally just find yourself bonding with someone, you know, getting close to someone, you're like, I feel like I've known you my whole life, and, and without, the, without, the romance, without the romance aspect of it, you just feel so comfortable with the person, right? You feel a sense of chemistry. Even we're talking about like bromance, right? Brothers coming together, you know, all that kind of stuff. Not in the inappropriate way. Call it bromance, right? You know, you just met someone for the first time, brother, you know, mashallah, you guys hit it off. 
sisters, you hit it off, not in, not in the inappropriate way again, but uh, instead you just feel an affinity towards one another. That's chemistry. And chemistry is sunnah. There should be a level of chemistry. There should be a level of chemistry. But at the same time, to, to, to ignore rationale, to ignore rationale in favor of emotion is just not a very smart thing to do. And it could re result in disastrous consequences because usually and, uh, you, know, you find out about a person afterwards. You find out about the true nature of the person. This is whether you take precautions or not. We already said this. You don't really know a person until you, you, know, until you really, really start to spend a lot of time with them. Okay? Now, the reason why in, we take those precautions is because in essence... Let me, and, and I hate to use this analogy because it might sound disrespectful, but I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's just for the sake of getting the point across. If you go to a car dealership, all right, and I'm not comparing marriage to a car dealership, nor am I comparing a woman to a car, nor am I comparing a man to a car, all right? I'm just, I'm just giving this example. If you go to a car dealership what's the, and you see a car that you really like, but it's too expensive, right? And you go, ah, eh, you know, I, I can't afford that. What's the car dealer going to try to get you to do? Take it for a ride. <laughs> All right. Take it for a test drive. Sisters, you are not cars, nor am I, nor am I using at that. Brothers, you are not cars, nor am I using at that. All right. But in essence, why does the car dealer, and, and you know, it's funny because if you study psychology, they actually get, take you through all of these different situations and things like that. So I studied psychology for fun. All right. It was just interesting to me. Like, so I remember in one class we were doing the simulations. Why is that? After you test drive a car, in essence, the dealer is trying to get you to make an emotional decision, not a rational decision. That's the dealer's job. Okay? He wants you to make the most emotional decision possible because you test drive that car and you get off the car and you're like, oh, God. See how smooth that thing drove? Like, you know, look at, look at the exterior and did you feel that massage and did you feel the seat warmers and all kinds of stuff like that? Whatever it is that cars can do now. Right? And in essence, in three weeks, it's just going to be a, a car that gets you from point A to point B. Right? But at the same time, it's like in the very beginning, initially, that, ex that factor of excitement, anticipation, right? That's what's, that's what's being stirred here in order to cloud your rationale. So you're going to break the bank, put yourself in debt, just so you can drive a car that looked amazing to you. And you knew it was a bad decision, right? You could have just took the Camry. All right, or the Corolla. You knew it was a bad decision, but at the same time, you know, you figured it out too late. All right? And in essence here, there's a few things that, that I want to mention here. So we said chemistry is important. You cannot know someone, you cannot know someone until you do one of three things. This is what Omar ibn Khattab said. So there's three ways to know people. What do they say they are? Anybody know? Travel. Either you travel with the person, live with the or you live with the person, or you did business with the person. So that's three ways that you figure people out. <laughs> so you don't really know someone until you do one of those three things anyway. All right. And, and the issue, and the thing is here again, we take precautions. We don't, we don't pretend that there is that there is no such thing as a marriage that went the wrong way, even though all precautions were taken, you know, in the way that they were supposed to. So there was the guy that opted for the Toyota. Then the brakes went out. It's not common, but you know what? It happens, right? And when a person has faith, they understand that, you know what? That's, that's, that's a test. But that happens at a much lesser rate when people do take the proper precautions to make sure that they're marrying people for the right reasons. And you know what happens? And, and by the way, is it permissible in Islam to marry someone because you think that they're beautiful? Yeah. yeah. It is permissible. Is it permissible to marry someone because they've got money? Yes. It's permissible. It's unethical. It's permissible. <laughs> All right. Is it permissible to marry someone because of social status? Yes. yes, it is. All of those things are permissible. It's not haram. You know, it's not forbidden in Islam. But the Prophet ﷺ, he says, choose the religion, may your hands be covered in dust. That was an expression of the Arabs to say, you will be at loss otherwise. Because you know what happens psychologically when people marry, when you marry someone because of their beauty? When you marry someone because of their money, when you marry someone because of their status, when you marry someone because of this or because of that. And status now would mean uh, you marry someone because they're a doctor. You marry someone because, you know, that's what status would mean now in our contemporary society. All right? In essence, 
if anything happens to one of those things, or if anything happens to the thing, on the basis of which you married the other person, the marriage falls apart. Okay? Now, so what happens is people marry, most of the time people marry, you know, on the basis of attraction. Attraction is the starting point. Right? Attraction is the starting point. People marry on the basis of attraction. And they're willing to ignore all of the ugliness on the inside because of attraction. And naturally, when you physically get involved with somebody, then you're even, you're, you know, you're even more drugged up, right? You're more under the spell. And then once you get married, and you've been with the same person for an extended period of time, the beauty wears off because there is nothing internal to enhance that beauty. Rather, you figured out that that was just a mask. And this is for men and women, right? This is for men and women. It's superficial. So when that thing disappears, the marriage falls apart. Now, if you marry on the basis of religion, if you choose someone, if you pursue someone on the basis of religion or on the basis of character, okay, those are things that are intangible. Those are things that continue to last. Those are things that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that you work together to enhance. And if you enhance those things together, then the marriage naturally gets better. You know, you have common purpose, you work together with that character. Why? Because in essence, each party sees the other party as their ticket to paradise. Right? Each party sees the other party, each spouse sees the other spouse as their ticket to paradise. Okay? By me satisfying you and being, you know, and, and being the best husband possible, by you being the best wife possible, you're actually pleasing the Creator. How many traditions, you know, there are, you know, and, and one of the ulama, I forgot, I think it was Imam Safarini. He said that there are 87 hadiths, 87 statements from the Prophet ﷺ, just encouraging good treatment between the spouses and the reward of doing so. Right? The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, uh, you know, that whenever, you know, he, so he mentioned the reward of, of even a person, you know, even a, a husband or a wife becoming intimate with one another in, in, in a way that's permissible. There's a reward. There is actually a spiritual reward for that. And the companions asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how is that possible? What does this have to do with spirituality? And he said, well, if you would have pursued those lusts in ways that were impermissible, wouldn't you have been penalized for that? Yes. So likewise, you, you are rewarded when you pursue them in ways that Allah has allowed you to pursue them. Likewise, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you know, a morsel of food that you place in the, in, in the mouth of your spouse, you know, you're feeding, literally taking, and this is from the sunnah of the Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, taking a spoonful of food and putting it in your spouse's mouth, not out of anger, not like, you know, you want your, you want your food, <laughs> all right, but rather out of kindness. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that's, that's a form of charity. It's sadaqah. Right? It's a form of charity. There's so many different ahadith, so many different statements. So whenever the other person sees their spouse as half of their religion, they naturally go the extra mile. They always try to go the extra mile to please that person. And subhanAllah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, the way that you see those marriages last, and the way that you see those marriages survive the test of time. Marriages that are for those reasons, marriages that are established on pure, rational reasons. Yes, with the element of chemistry. Yes, with the element of chemistry, but not on pure emotion, not on pure nonsense, not on pure infatuation. Okay? And we see the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he gets married. And subhanAllah, those types of marriages, they can survive. You know, and, and, and you know, one of the most extraordinary examples is actually a modern-day example. You know, we always talk about, we always talk about, you know, history. The companions were this, or and the companions for those of you who are non-Muslims are like equivalent to like the disciples for us. So we keep saying the companions, right? You're talking about a, a, an honorable, great generation. But you know, I, I, I can think of a modern-day example that just blo that blows me away every time I think about it. And it's a it's a brother and a sister. And when I say brother and sister, I mean a Muslim brother and sister, husband and wife in Texas, because you've actually got brothers and sisters married to each other in Texas probably, but um, <laughs> a husband and a wife in Texas. And this is in Houston in particular. Uh, the sister, her father is a scholar. She is also a scholar. And she memorizes the Qur'an. Her husband is a convert. Okay? He's, you know, he comes from, from a good culture, very strong cultured person. He's Hispanic and, and, and his culture 
they have a lot of, you know, a lot of the idea, a lot of the principles of Islam in terms of courtesy and things of that sort. So, you know, he became Muslim. He's a convert. He was Muslim for two years. He married the sister, and you know, it's, 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 it was an incredible marriage. They have they have children, and the sister actually, uh, you know, developed cataracts and she actually went blind. Now. This, this man who's a convert, now obviously, that's something that can really hurt a marriage. But he treats her so well now. And he does it with a smile and he doesn't make her feel, and this is in her words, and in the words, the children are observing this, right? Treats her so well, you know, that, that it's almost like she feels like, you know, and, and whenever he's asked why, he says, because she's my ticket to paradise. She's my ticket to paradise. So that they feel like they have to, he feels like he consistently has to serve her for the sake of God. Now, is every man going to be that sweet? No. <laughs> no. Don't expect that. All right? I, I, I admit that I'm giving a very extreme example, but the point is, is what? don't you think it's his religion? It's his, it's his faith that allows him to love his wife and honor her in that, in that manner? Yes. And that's why when we look in the history... I'm about to go break for Q&A, inshallah, just a few minutes, just on a closing note. If we look in the history of Islam, we find marriages where people, you know, they suffered hard times. They went through circumstances that, that would really try a marriage. Um, finances, you know, when, when a couple faces financial hardship, that can really try a marriage. That can stress them out. That can really try a marriage. We witnessed times where people were tried in that regard. Really, when we look at Abu Darda. <coughs> Abu Dardat is, is, is a great scholar. Now, for those of you that um, took the class, we talked about Abu Dardat, right? How, you know, whenever Salman al farisi saw Abu Dardat's wife, you know, she was she she didn't have you know she had she didn't have good clothes, you know, he was neglectful towards her. He wasn't spending time with her, and she said he has no need for this for this world. He's just he's always worshiping God. And then Salman taught Abu Dardat the meaning of balance, you know. And, and to be more, you know, to be to be a better husband in essence. Now, when Abu Darda is passing away, when he's passing away, Umar Darda says something very beautiful. And, and you know, Abu Darda, you know, they lived a life of hardship. They really never experienced luxury. They never experienced these things. But they loved each other. And when he's passing away, she says to him, and it's very beautiful. She says to him, you know, in this world, in this life, you asked my father for my hand in marriage, and I accept it. And she said, what I want you to do is I want you to ask Allah, I want you to ask God for my hand in marriage in paradise. I want to be engaged to you in Jannah. So, literally, she got engaged to him in paradise, and he passed away, radiallahu anhu. Um Darda obviously is, is, and by the way, she's one of the greatest scholars of all time. She actually taught many of the Sahaba. She actually had her own halaqa, Um Darda. She's a great scholar in Islam. And she was also a woman of great beauty. She was also a woman of honor, right? She, she was well known. And because she's like, the, she is, she is the, she's a alima, she's a true scholar, the true sense of the word. She teaches male and female Sahaba. She's well known as, uh, for her scholarship, you know? It wasn't like it is now, you know, where, where if a woman is, is, is a widow or a woman is divorced, then, you know, it's, it's like, no, you know, you don't have people asking for her anymore. No. This woman, whenever her husband passed away, she got a proposal from the Khalifa. She got a proposal from Muawiyah, who was very wealthy, who was a Khalifa, who was also righteous. He's from Kutab al Wahi, those who wrote down the revelation. He's a companion of the Messenger. And she responds to him. You know, she sends back a letter saying, I can't marry you because I'm already engaged to Abu Darda in Jannah. I'm already engaged to Abu Darda in Paradise. There, there are things that, that having common purpose, having faith, having character can do to a couple to, to, enhance, to keep a couple together and to allow a couple to, uh, to overcome the natural, the natural obstacles that come with marriage. It's only natural that if you've been used to having your space your entire life, and now you're with another person all the time, that there's going to be conflict. But what did Allah teach us? That if you see something you don't like, focus on what you do like. The concept of compromise. 
You can't just break it off whenever you feel like breaking it off. Okay? To give marriage a chance to actually try your best to grow together. Okay? And to, and to always try to focus on, first and foremost, whether or not you are fulfilling your duties uh, to the other person, to the, to the other party, before you focus on your own rights. Okay? You focus on your responsibilities. This, these are very Islamic concepts. So in essence, having someone who is God-fearing, so having someone who is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ensures that even when the other spouse is going through a hard time, okay, even when the other spouse is going through a hard time, their good character and their good religion, you know, their good sense of gratitude to God will allow that person to go the extra mile for it. And that's the type of marriage that you want to look for. And first and foremost, how does that start? And I'm going to end on this. Just a question. How does that start? How do you start, how do you start the process of Marrying a person that is good and God-fearing. You look at yourself. Okay? You know, there's, there's a quote that I heard uh, about a few years ago, that if you, if you want a wife that's like Khadija, be more like Muhammad And likewise, if you want a husband that's more like Muhammad then be more like Khadija. Right? It, you know, you look at your, yourself. There's deep introspection. Allah tells us in the Quran, pure men are for pure women and pure women are for pure men. The type of character that you have, the type of religion that you have, okay? The way you carry yourself. One of the greatest, um, uh, and, and I say this, and I know that some people might find this offensive, but I can't remember the name of the article. But I think it was, what's, what's the guy's name? Uh, Naomi, um, what's his name? What's the famous author's name? I'm, I'm having a hard time recalling it. But he said that one of one of the, the, the worst things that one of the greatest contradictions that we have is that a person you know says that I'm looking for someone who's going to love me for who I am on the inside, but flaunts everything on the outside to attract the person. And that's for men and women. I'm not, I'm not just talking about flaunting everything from a physical standpoint, right? You're saying I want someone for to respect me and love me for who I am on the inside. But even, you know, your, your money, your reputation, your status, you use those types of things to attract the spouse. And then you say that, well, I want them to love me for my religion and character. Right? I want them to love me for the right reasons. It's a contradiction. What message are you giving off? Right? What are you actually trying to attain? In essence, in Islam, that concept, that respectful barrier that's there, that, that line of respect that's not to be crossed while getting to know one another, right, before marriage, is to ensure that you're getting married for the right reasons, that you're getting married for what's on the inside, okay? That, that you're getting married for the things that would keep a marriage going and that would keep a marriage, you know, full of love and full of respect and honor. Um, so inshallah ta'ala, with that, I'm gonna, I don't, are we gonna take a break before questions and answers? We're just gonna go straight to it. What do you think, Mr. Moderator? It wasn't decided, the break was decided. Break wasn't decided. Yes. Do you guys want a five-minute break? Or you just want to go to Q and A and then end it up at the other Q and A. Every second is precious. Every second is precious. Every second is precious. All right. Questions. Be direct. And I'd like to encourage. By the way, um, if we have you know non-Muslims in the audience today, I know that a lot of times at NSA events, I'm being really honest. You know, it, it can be intimidating when you're surrounded by a bunch of Muslims, so you might feel uncomfortable. You know, to ask your question. Ask your questions direct. Don't feel, don't, don't be shy. No one's going to bite you. No one's going to hurt you. No one's going to blow you up. All right? <laughs> That's all we need. All right, so questions. Go ahead. Muslims and non-Muslims. I'll go sister first and then brother. So go ahead. Okay. My question is how valid and how legitimate are products? Because I had, I had a friend who prayed for me and she was like, So your question, so so the question is, how valid is this tefano? Okay, how valid is this tefano prayer? The first problem with what you just mentioned is that she got an amazing feeling. Istikhara has nothing to do with feeling; it has absolutely zero to do with how you feel about something. In fact, istikhara is when you've made your best decision, when you've got a feeling that you know what I think that after taking the proper precautions, that this person is the best person for me. Then you pray istikhara, asking Allah that if it's good for you. And in particular, good for you in your dunya, in your life, and in your akhirah, and in your hereafter. So that's the second thing. It's good for you in your in your life, 
ending your hereafter, then facilitate it. And if it's bad for me in, in my life and in my hereafter, then put obstacles between me and it. As so, I mean, you pursue it. It's valid because because it's taught to us by the divine. So there's no doubt about its validity. But I'm trying to, when we're talking about the understanding of it. Now, again, the way that people understand it, unfortunately, is not the way that it was, is not what its intended purpose was. Okay? Istikhara. There, Allah might test a person with a bad spouse. And by the way, it could be that a negative experience is the reason why they have a successful marriage after that. It could be that. There could be other things. There could be things that we are not aware of because again, you can't separate. As Muslims at least, we can't separate the element of faith from it. So I give the example of Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. You, know, you talk about a woman that got dealt to bad hands. Right? She's a righteous woman and she's not married to you know, a guy that doesn't pray or a guy that's mean. She's married to Pharaoh. You know? And, uh, as much as some women would insist that their husbands are worse than Fir'aun. <laughs> Fir'aun's pretty bad. Okay. And she, she called on to God, and when she called on to God, she said, Oh Allah, build for me with you, so I want your companionship in paradise. I don't even want this, I just want your companionship in paradise. And that was the best thing that ever happened to her. Another example is Um Salama. Um Salama marries Abu Salama. And may Allah be pleased with them. Abu Salama is a great companion, there's no doubt about it. And she loved him. And, you know, uh, she had children, they had children together. And then he died. You know, he was killed. And so, on the outside, it's like, why is that happening? Why, why is that happening? Why would she go through something like that? And she made dua to Allah, trusting, you know, she supplicated Allah, trusting that the best thing would happen for her. And then came the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam to marry her. Okay, so the, the, the point is, is that it could be that through that negative experience, that negative, uh, you know, through that negative experience that you end up being married to, the, to, the, to a better person, that you end up finding something in your life that's better. There's actually a, a, um, this website, and I know it's, it's, it's kind of weird when we talk, but I think it, it's actually done in the right way. It's called eternalgarment.com, which is particularly uh, for, you know, uh, helping people that, that have been in previous relationships. So helping divorce, divorcees or widows get married, get remarried. And just last week, as a matter of fact, I, I met a couple that both came from divorce, that were both <coughs> divorced, okay, and got married. And uh, they just they were so happy. And what the woman said to me was profound. She said that had I not gotten married the first time and got divorced, I would have never met my husband who got married the first time and got divorced. Meaning, it all turned, you know, I'm so happy right now. You know, the, this, and, and through those negative experiences, so for example, sometimes you might have made mistakes also that contributed towards that marriage falling apart. Whether or not you were <coughs> responsible, or you might have been partially responsible, even if by 10%, right? You might have contributed 10% and the other party contributed 90%. But through that, you learned. You learned through your experiences. And you just never know. The point is, is that as Muslims, we can't separate the component of faith because in our, you know, in, in, our, in our faith, we believe that there's no such thing as absolute evil. There's no such thing as something that is absolutely bad. There's wisdom behind everything happening. So, istikhara is certainly valid because it's taught to us by the divine. And, you know, it could be that, and it could be that reason also from an Islamic perspective. It could be through that test and that trial that Allah enters a person into paradise. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that if a person is tested by any need, by any anxiety, distress, illness, even the prick of a thorn, that it purifies the believer from their sins. So it could be through that experience that if a person is patient, becomes mature, perhaps, you know, I, I've seen a woman that was in an abusive relationship. And after that abusive relationship, and I remember counseling her, telling her to get out of it, hurry up and get out of it, don't stay with that person after getting out of that relationship, she has counseled and helped hundreds of women that are in the same situation as her. It basically gave her her calling. It gave her her purpose. And alhamdulillah, she just got remarried two months ago, actually. Right? But it gave her her calling. It gave her her purpose. So we, we don't believe that there's something that's 100% that's absolute, that's absolute negative, that's absolute evil. All right, so... Can you clarify that issue of Istikhara? Because, I mean, a lot of times people do think about that dream thing. I saw a dream and, you know, this is how it turned out. Um, and, you know, a lot of religious people would tell you the same thing. Um, That's why we don't listen to religious people only in Islam. We, we listen to the religion. 
Um, religious people will tell you some crazy stuff. So you'll hear religious people tell you recite Surah Al-Fatiha 47 times and hop around on one leg. <laughs> the religion is not responsible for crazy religious people. Um, and so, so in essence, the absence of proof in religion means uh, inv it means it's invalid. There is no hadith. There is no saying of any of the companions or any scholar, any credible or reputable scholar in history that said that you should see a dream after you pray istikhara. In fact, there, you know, and we know there are classifications of dreams in Islam. Not every dream that you see is a real dream. It's a true dream. There's hadith and nafs. There's just your, your mind regurgitating <coughs> the things that you saw throughout the day in weird ways. Okay, putting things together. Hadith and nafs, this, this exists even in our faith. If you're thinking about something constantly and consistently, Right, if you're thinking about another person consistently, you know, there's a pretty good there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna see a, a dream about that person. It has nothing to do with revelation, has nothing to do with istikhara, you've just been thinking about that person all day. And that's hadith and nafs. You're regurgitating those thoughts throughout the day. So there is no proof whatsoever in anything from the Sunnah about seeing a dream. Especially not the colors thing. I don't has anyone I don't I don't yeah, I don't even want to ask the question. But I've never met a person that, that actually worked for that you actually saw a certain type of color. Right? Unless it's just delusional, you might just be lying to yourself or lying to others, you know, but but I've never actually seen that. I, I, I had a a thing that happened so I mentioned the papers under the pillow thing. Oh man, that was uh, that actually was a real story, that was a true story. There's a sister, and I'm not going to name what country she's from because then it can get offensive. Um, but there's a sister from a certain country that I actually, um, you know, I actually helped helped her meet who was possibly going to be her future husband, and I was really happy about it. And then uh, she gives me a call the next day, and she's just bawling. She's just in tears, and she's like. And I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna because I did this before and I got in trouble for it. But you know, she's like, she's like, Sheikh Omar, I pray this tahara, and the answer was no. <laughs> and it was actually really dramatic. It was like the answer was no. <laughs> it was so dramatic. I'm like, what do you mean the answer was no? What are you talking about? So then she told me that literally in her family in, in her custom they literally take sheets of paper and then I've seen I've seen another sister who in their family they take a sheet of Quran and they put it in water and then they drink the water with the ink of it and that's just disgusting that's <laughs> I don't know how it's going to help you determine who you're going to but anyway so yeah the deen is simple people make it complicated yeah um, it's two things it's really quick one um, saying that uh, um, the wife of uh, Zainab. 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 Was she the daughter of the Prophet? She, well, there, there's a different, there's a different Zainab that we're talking. Zainab was a very common name in the Sea. So we're not talking about the daughter of the Prophet. Okay. And uh, other thing, um, is it permissible for the man to see the woman without hijab prior to marriage? Absolutely not. Not in any madhab. Not in any school of thought. Absolutely not. So what's the permissibility? There is some differences. What you display in public, what you display your face and your hands, that is permissible. Okay, but absolutely not. And there's no method that says that. I don't know where people got that from. Again, I like the love. They said there's a minority opinion that maybe you can. That's See out of the four methods. Okay, that's another one. That's out of the four methods. Okay. That's in the Baha'i <coughs> And it's a very, it's an, it's a lot of It's a very odd opinion. It has no basis. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right, anybody else? Well, actually, every, I know we got a lot of questions. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, uh, sister, brother, sister, brother. So, my question is, um, how important is your appearance from that side in Islam? Like, how important is it the way you carry yourself as much as you do as much as how important, how important is your, your appearance? Your appearance from the outside is important in Islam. Like, how does it influence your um, personality? Basically, people judge you from the outside, so they just say the way, the way you dress. Okay, how important is appearance on the outside? Uh, because people judge you from the way that you dress. All right. The way that I, the way that I would answer that question is that as, as a Muslim, you are not allowed to judge the intentions or judge the heart of another person. Okay? Now, when you seek marriage, 
you are trying to make your best judgment, not of the person's hereafter, nor are you trying to belittle a person. If you're trying to make your best judgment, in essence, you should see in your spouse what you would want to see in your children. Okay, what you would want to see in your children. Um, as far as outward appearance is concerned, some of it is important. So if it in involves an issue of obligation, okay, obligation, or lack of obligation, okay, then it is important because a person's connection to Allah and the Messenger slice them should go way beyond an emotional connection. It should manifest itself in practice. It should manifest. We don't believe love in, in, in our faith. Love is not just an emotional attachment. Okay? Love is practice. Love is following what they want us to do, what Allah wants us to do, what Allah sees pleasing to us. So that's that's what's important. Now as far as you know, as far as like getting over the obsessed with appearance, that can happen too. That I think and it's a vague question, so I'm giving you a vague answer, by the way. Because you're not being specific. So I have to give you a general answer. So. No, I mean, as in to, like, you know, some, let's say, a sister does not wear a hijab, mm -hmm. you know, or a brother is doing something that's not allowed in Islam, but it's just that little tiny thing. Let's just say... Those are two say, very separate issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take the issue of uh, a wearing, a having Pearson. Like, What's that? For guys, having Pearson. Having, okay. Like, wearing hair. And okay. So, if a person wearing an ear piercing, um, well, it's, one thing is that it's not allowed in Islam, so that's one thing, right? So, obviously, if I'm looking for someone of religious commitment, if I'm looking for someone of religious commitment, that can be a warning sign. But if I see that all the other things are good, you brought up even hijab, if I see the other things are good, then there's nothing wrong with me pointing that out politely, frankly, to a person, because I see everything is good, but, you know, you know this is haram, or you know this is fadl, or you know, so what do you think? You know, is this something that you could see yourself doing? There's nothing wrong with that. All right, but I don't, you know, I don't think a person should put themselves in that situation. You know, especially, you know, and by the way, um, to be really, really, really frank, uh, you know, when people say that I want people to know that I don't care about what they think, you know, I don't, I, I want people to know that I really don't care about their opinion, so what do they do? They do things that, that, that go against social norm to show that I don't care what you think. But in reality, what are you doing? You're sending the exact opposite message because what they think is still dictating the way that you carry yourself and the way that you dress and your appearance, right? Because you're, <laughs> instead, you know, you're trying to send a message that it's important to me that you know, and I know that you know, and you know that I know that you know, <laughs> that I could care less about how you feel about me. So it's a contradiction. Yeah. Um, Mike, so now, you know, getting married is really so difficult. Uh, so how how much Islam give us space to you know um, each other before we get engaged? For example, getting you know, on the first question before you get to engagement period. How much space you have to meet, set, and to Okay, so uh, so the question is, how much space do you have? How much time do you have uh, to get to know a person before you get married? And Allah and the Messenger of Allah have left that open for a reason. It should be to a point where it's not excessive, to a point where what's important is being discussed. So once your conversations are turning into, so how was your day and what did you eat for lunch and did you like it? And I love you and, and good night. And, then you know that it's gone to an extreme. Okay, but it's, it should be a, t a point to where you're discussing things that are relevant to the marriage and to 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 a future uh, relationship. Of, you know, to to a, conducive to a healthy relationship. So when it gets to that point where it's folly and it's meaningless talk, that's when you know that that you know it's gotten to a point where where you know it should be stopped. So that's and, and see there are a lot of things in the Sharia that are left to the judgment, to you know to your own judgment. All right. You have to know, you have to have that tough way, you have to have that control to know, all right, it's gotten to a point where I need to make a decision or not. Right. You have to be able to do that. Okay, so, you know, and different people are different ways. Some people just hit it off, you know, after, after a few times. Some people need more time. One thing that, I, that I'm very, that, that I personally insist on, if, if I know two people that are thinking of getting married, is that they discuss directly, explicitly, their views on marriage, on the rights and responsibilities of each party. 
that's so important. You know, one thing that I used to do is I used to, you know, I would, I would say that you give each spouse a book to read or, or each potential spouse a book to read or a lecture to listen to on the right or the responsibilities that they have towards the other party and then see if they have a clear understanding. Because if your ideas of the role of husband and wife are clashing from the start, it's not going to be good. It's going to turn into a, a power struggle, right? It's just going to be two, two people butting heads all the time. Yes. At that Sorry. point, actually, I know that in Malaysia, before they get married, they, get, they take a crash course, like one yes. week or two weeks. That's one point, uh, maybe you can elaborate. But another, my, another question was, you know, you discussed the criteria for marriage and all these things. Uh, can you make a comment about uh, green card seekers for marriage? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> First thing, Jazakallah um, for bringing that up. First thing, is anyone here from Malaysia? Anyone from Malaysia? No? I just came back from Malaysia. This is awesome, mashallah. Amazing country. SubhanAllah, amazing country. Um, you know, and I was, and I was uh, really impressed by, by just the hospitality of the people. So, yes. As the brother mentioned, um, and I heard this while I was over there too. Ironically, I did a lecture on marriage in Malaysia. That was really, it was really cool because I was learning their social norms while I was lecturing on marriage and things of that sort. But they actually take a crash course before they get married. Like they actually have to take a two-week course before they get married on the rights and responsibilities of the husband and the wife. As far as green card seekers are concerned, uh, for one thing. And, and in essence, someone that's trying to get married because they're trying to get legal paperwork done. To be honest with you, you know, I've, I've, been in, I've been in many situations where I've seen people who have, who have really, really, really um, acted in very inappropriate manners with that. Number one, getting married with the intention of divorce is halal. Okay, that's basically adultery on paper. All right, getting married with the intention of divorce is halal. So, so the idea of you know temp giving someone or getting married temporarily so that a person can get their green paper is haram. In fact, it's adultery. Um, number two. So so here's the way I'd break it down. Ninety-five percent of the people that have been in that boat that I've seen that I've personally dealt with, and this is just in my capacity of being imam for six years in New Orleans previously. Ninety-five percent of the time, it was insincere in its nature. And it was, you know, I just want to hurry up and get married to someone so I can get my legal paperwork. There was, however, that 5%. And that 5% can be brought in where it's just a good brother, you know, or, or someone who's really a good person that wants to get married. The green card is not their intention, okay? And, and the proof of that is that they're not settling for just anybody in terms of religion, character. And so there are warning signs, there are indications. Again, it's a very small minority of that group, but who just cannot get married because because of the, the, the other 95% the other um, who have acted in very inappropriate ways. Okay, so that's, that's my take on it. Yes. Uh, okay, what would you consider for a man or woman who want to get married but they can't just because of a race? Like what kind of Men and women that don't want, that, that, that want to get married but are being prevented just because of the race. I assume that it's the parents? Most likely, yeah. Okay. But also, because in a certain country, you probably might know just by, you know, describing it, that it's not allowed for the girls to get married to any other race or from other country. Yeah. So that's a whole, that's, that's, that's legality. I mean, that's, I, I can't <coughs> discuss that. But so it depends on the situation. If the parents are stepping in and trying to prevent them, or if it's, it's legal. I, I don't even know how to deal with it if it's a legal issue. But if they're here in America, but yet they can't go back, that well, it depends if, if they if they intend to go back to that country, if they need to go back to the country, so if their parents live in that country, if they still have, then it's, then it's probably a hard, it's probably a difficult uh, task. You know, look, uh, as far as the parents are concerned, I want to mention this from the start. I think it's important to involve your family from the very start of the conversation, from the beginning of the conversation. Many times parents are unjustified in the things that they put as obstacles. But at the same time, you know, many, time, there, many times there's also some fault on the prospective spouses in that 
you know, they've been talking for like years or, you know, for a long time and then they've, they've come to the parents and then when the parents, you know, start to mention their reasons, which, which are sometimes, uh, and you might argue a majority of the times, irrational, they blow up on their parents and it causes this huge rip. I think it's important to involve, you know, involve everyone in the process. Let every, not, and when I say involve everyone in the process, I don't mean sit between your parents and let them sit and then have that. I don't mean that. I mean, you know, at least keep them in the loop. Make them feel like they're important to that decision. Uh, don't set yourself up for heartbreak. You know, try to try to find those things. If you are finding that it's difficult to marry someone who meets the criteria of Allah and the Messenger Islam, and also your criteria for marriage, uh, and your parents' criteria for marriage, so if, you, if you're finding that you can't find someone that, that's combining those three things and what's standing in the way is your parents' criteria, then then that's when you know you, you go to an imam and that's that's when you speak to someone you know who's you know who, who's considered an authority uh, and not a legal authority but rather it's from ahkam al sultaniyah which is you know again the ruler but obviously there's no ruler in, that, in the Muslim community but the imam who takes the place of contracting marriages which is the place of the sultan he takes that place but you go to the local imam you go to someone who you can kind of you know show your case you know show your case to that, you know, my parents are being unreasonable. And if your parents are standing in the way of a marriage for something that is un-Islamic, then you have the right to still pursue that marriage. Now, why do I say that it's important to involve them from the very start? Is because you don't want that to happen. Because when two people get married and it's without the... And, and let's say even if it's technically and legally allowed, when two people get married and their parents are not happy about that, and there's like a rift that's created, it does affect the marriage itself. Resentment tends to build between the spouses, right? That you made me, you know, break, break, break <coughs> off of my family. You cause this resentment breaks between the spouses. And plus, you have two sides that are consistent. You have an external influence on what's already a difficult task, which is to be married and to, you know, and to, and to face those obstacles together. You have an external influence that's telling you that I told you you shouldn't have done that. So that's that's just destructive to a marriage. So I think it's important to involve you know involve the relevant parties from the start. Uh, yeah. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. What is the love at first sight? Love at first sight. Again, there is a level of chemistry. Chemistry is acknowledged in the Sunnah, but. Love at first sight, and, and actually, I'm going to pull out this article that I was just uh, <laughs> reading because it was actually talking about the, the, the concept of love at first sight. Uh, hold on, I got to find it. There was a good a good paragraph on love at first sight, and the signal's really bad in here, which is why you guys have been paying attention, right? You couldn't surf right <laughs> you go on the internet. Uh, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. All right. Romantic love is widely celebrated as the pinnacle of love. It is marketed as the peak experience without which you cannot say, uh, without which you cannot say you have lived. The signs of its allure are everywhere, not just on Valentine's Day. Take the cost of the average wedding. It has rocketed in recent years, now easily topping 20,000 pounds in the UK. It is as if couples make a direct link between romantic value and cash value. Or think of the cinema where romantic comedies are big box office. I'm reading off a crack screen, by the way, thanks to my three-year-old daughter. <laughs> if you get the formula right of lovers finally falling into each other's arms, you net hundreds of millions of dollars. Or again, there are the dating websites that are recession-proof, 60% growth in spending last year, according to reports. Love is blind, the proverb goes, Though it might be more accurate to say we are being blinded by a hyper version of romantic love and are losing out on life as a result. To cut to the chase, I think that the romantic myth is one of the most um, is, the, is one of the most destructive of our times. The myth is that there's someone out there with whom your life will be complete, and conversely, without whom your life would be a half life. A major task of modern life is therefore to find this person and falling in love to cease to be two and become one. It's hard to prove, though, I wonder whether such a view of romance has become so monstrous in the pressure it puts on couples to find fulfillment in each other 
that it actually undermines more relationships than supports them. It is socially corrosive because it idealizes love. I already mentioned this one. Rather than understanding that love is made, not found. Love is made in the gritty ups and downs of being with someone who is as flawed as you. So they would protest that such a story shapes the plots of romantic novels and movies and the advertising blurb of online dating sites, but it's not real life. So there's more in this article, but and they actually have some statistics. The point is, is that no, absolutely not. There is a, there could be, there could be a, a certain type of chemistry at first. There could be some form of affection, but just blindly falling in love with someone at first light, at, at first sight, can actually be the worst thing that ever happens to you. Because again. It could be that it ends up and it materializes in things that uh, it manifests itself in things that actually turn out to be harmful to the marriage and harmful to the relationship. Was that? Okay. <coughs> Another question. Yeah. Um, suppose in a marriage, the in-laws are down to death in the marriage, and they're pretty much asking us not to choose the wife or the parents. Who has more right over the husband? Great question. Right. I hear a lot of talking on this side. So Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm gonna repeat the question. Suppose that if the if the parents are you know are the in laws are so involved in the marriage that basically they're saying that they're saying to the son that you either choose your wife or you choose us. Who has the most right? Um, it is not uh, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah wrote actually a, a, a large a large I think it's like seventeen pages on this topic in his Majmur, where he said that it is not permissible for the son to listen to his parents to divorce his wife when they don't have a good reason. Because you're, you're committing vulm, you're committing transgression to someone else, to, towards someone else. And the hadith that's used, which is that Umar ibn al-Khattab told his son to divorce his wife, and he listened, and the Prophet ﷺ was okay with that was because the Prophet ﷺ trusted Umar's good reasoning. The Prophet ﷺ knows Umar would not, the person who feared God so much that if there was to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar, you know, would not have told his son to divorce his wife for trivial reasons. And it turned out to be something that was not trivial. Okay, so it's not fair to the wife that if my parents tell me, divorce her, that I just destroy a family, I destroy this woman's life, and I destroy everything because my parents told me no. And this falls under, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, لا طاعتني مخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to a creation when it entails disobedience to the Creator. The parents cannot force the son to divorce the wife in any way possible. Um, it's not fair, it's, it's transgression, it's oppression, it's wrong. And by the way, you know, a lot of times, uh, for, those, for those that still want to, you know, again, apply certain customs and things of that sort, and there are good things that we take from every culture as well. But, the concept of, you know, one of the things that I, that I see happening in Muslim communities in particular, specifically people that are, again, that are trying to fulfill certain customs, is that people are not given their space, and that just leads to a lot of clash. One of the things that's required in Islam, man istata'a minkum al da'a fadiyat that, okay, whoever amongst you has the means to get married, let him get married. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said the means to get married include being able to provide a reasonable living bin ma'roof and a separate home. A separate home. Why? So that the woman could have her space. A woman needs to have her space. The mother needs to have her space. The wife needs to have her space. Otherwise, you're going to have a wife and a mother-in-law that are consistently at each other's throats and the son that's caught in between and the husband that's caught in between. And the wife is telling the husband that you're not man enough to stand up to your mom. And the mom is telling the husband that you prefer your wife to me even though I raised you and I did everything for you. And, you know, that, that's just... And, and you know what's sad is that the kids see that sometimes. It's, just, it's, it's, just, it's a terrible situation. So I, am, I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that when you get married, you should bring your wife into your, into your house right now, in your living quarters, and not provide proper space and things of that sort. Uh, and, you know, there, there are exceptions to that. And that's one of the things that's important to discuss before marriage. Are you okay with this living arrangement? Look, I don't have the means right now to move out completely. Right? Are you okay if we're on the second story, for example, and we're on the first story, my parents... You, you should ask the, those types of questions. Those should be talked about in the very beginning. But I don't believe at all that if a person has the means 
to have their own home, their own place of living, that they should move the wife into into the family's house. And that's where all the issues come, not only with the parents, but, but also with brother-in-law. Hijab is not observed properly. So all kinds of stuff happens. So it's very uncomfortable, and it's very wrong. I, I saw some hands go up like passionately, like someone's really upset. So yes, go ahead. Um, what is your advice to someone who does not want to get married? And I know I can understand why you're saying that. Um, what is your advice to If a person does not fear for themselves, there is a difference of opinion on the issue, to be honest with you. But, but, but Allah Hard, the, the most moderate opinion on that is if a person really does not fear for themselves and does not does not fear for themselves in terms of zina, right? Then they have they can they can opt for that. It's they're, so basically they're they're depriving themselves of a sunnah or reward because it's rewarding to get married, it's rewarding to have children that will spread you know your knowledge that will give salat on your parents. You know those are they're, they're sources of reward in the marriage, following, getting married is a sunnah in and of itself, and, and some of the rewards that would come exclusively through marriage that otherwise could not be, um, could not be achieved. But, you would not be sinful if a person chose not to get married and they did not fear for themselves in zina. Uh, I don't know which hand went up. I think first. this sister has been trying to ask Where, you from the very beginning. Yeah. This is over here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm looking up here. Yeah. So I'm missing the first one. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm just going to ask, this might be a bit of a downer, but, um, the issue of sort of race and racism, so people will sort of say, well, I want to get married and I want to be married to someone of a particular race, so they're saying they're being like sort of conscious of race, but how do you deal with situations where people are using the marriage process as an excuse to be blatantly racist? Not even just subtly, but like straight out racist. Explain how do you deal with it as, as a mean, person who is a as victim of Individually and I guess on a community level, how do we deal with, with racism and with Muslims? Because we shouldn't be racist, but it's definitely something On a community racist. level, the first thing is that we talk about it. The second thing is that we lead by example. And that if someone comes to, you know, that we encourage people, our friends, our family, whatever it is, to break that, to break that, that taboo. You know, one thing, um, I'll tell you guys a, a, something. I mean, some, I know some of you are in mother students, right? So you might know Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif is Egyptian, right? Sheikh Naveed Aziz is from Pakistan. So I'll tell you guys a funny story. I went to Journey of Faith conference in Toronto last year, uh, or two years ago rather, and uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif was there, Sheikh Naveed Aziz, they're both, they're both you know, friends of mine. So you know, my wife was there, and their wives were also both there. So Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif is married to a Pakistani, and Sheikh Naveed Aziz is married to an Egyptian. <laughs> it is so awesome, and it's because here we're, we're standing around talking, and our wives are talking also right here, so we're talking there. And Sheikh Naveed's wife is like talking to him in Egyptian, and Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif is like speaking Urdu to his wife. <laughs> I was like, that's what I'm talking about, right? Uh, Dr. Alta Hussain. Dr. Alta Hussain, mashallah. Beautiful, beautiful person. May Allah bless him and his family. Um, you know, also you see an interracial marriage there. Alhamdulillah, those are things that are beautiful and I think community leaders need to lead by example. We talk about it, we speak about it on the manbar. We encourage, if, if we don't have the pulpit, we encourage those who do have the pulpit to start addressing the problem, right, of racism. Um, I personally gave a football called If Trayvon Came to the Masjid. If Trayvon came, when the whole Trayvon Martin was going on, the case was going I said if Trayvon came to the Masjid. So I talked about Racism on a practical level. I'm not a racist, but I would never marry my daughter or I would never marry someone of this this situation. I'm not a racist, but if I see an imam from this race, I'm not going to respect him. I'm going to, you know, I'm not a racist, but if this person walks into the masjid, I'm going to suspect something is up. I'm not a racist, but I call people certain names. I use labels that are derogatory, okay, that are that are that are completely impermissible in Islam. I'm not a racist, but so literally the whole football was I'm not a racist, but okay. And there were people that got up and left in the middle of the khutbah. <laughs> well, I'm not even playing. So I mentioned, and I, and I was very explicit in the khutbah. Has anyone seen that khutbah? Why Trayvon, if Trayvon went to the masjid? Is it okay. on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube. <laughs> um, but, you know, in particular, so I was mentioning, even in our communities, you know, we, we use terminology, so if a person says, you know, uh, the, the word abid or qallu and those types of things, you are being, sh you are committing a sin. These are, these are, it's sinful to say those things, 
And to say, well, that person, I don't mean it that way. When Abu Darda said to Bilal, radiallahu anhu, Yabn al-Sawda, son of a black woman, it was true, he really is the son of a black woman. And it's not about how it's not about how you mean it, it's about how the other person takes it. Okay, so these are these these words are haram, this is bad adab, bad khuluq. To say them in the in the context the way that they're said. So on many ways, yes, there is deep racism. But alhamdulillah, I do I'm optimistic and when I mention like Sheikh Muhammad Sharif Sheikh, these are people that are born and raised again in Canada. All right, which is not a real country, right? But, <laughs> but you know, they're born in the Western. I think that with our generation, that's, that stuff is totally insignificant. I, it's not totally, totally insignificant because some of us are corrupted from our parents, unfortunately, or, or not just not our parents, that's their uncles, aunts, sometimes, or people from a culture, and we just kept we heard that rhetoric so much growing up that for some minds they've been polluted, they've been corrupted by that. But I'm almost positive, inshallah, that the generation after us will completely have, they would have completely done away with that whole thing. Right? I know for me, like, and it's funny because when I go overseas and I've got, you know, I've got my daughter made and like my in-laws and like people are already like arguing, we're like, are you going to marry your daughter to a non-Palestinian? I'm like, I'm going to marry my daughter to the best person possible, inshallah. I could care less. I could care less where he's from or what color he is, or what culture he is, and like they're already like fighting with me, like no, but what if, what if she? Get, I'm like she's three. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, Why are you having this discussion with me? You know? <laughs> Let me enjoy my daughter while she's young. You know? <laughs> but like, what if when she gets married, she's gonna want to come to Jordan, and he's gonna want to go to Pakistan, or he's gonna want to go to Somalia? I'm like, what are you gonna do then? I'm like, well, they'll just have to pay a little bit of extra money and go to two different countries. <laughs> they're gonna have to budge. They're gonna have to alternate summers, but. Just so we got it. We have, to, inshallah, it'll go. It's starting to go away already, inshallah. All right. Okay. okay. So I have two questions. One question is, um, what's your opinion on marriages back home? One. And second question is, uh, the cost of marriages these days. What's your opinion on that? On that as well? Oh God. All right. First question, opinion on marriages back home. I think we have plenty of prospective spouses here in America, and I think it's easier to marry someone who's from the same cultural context as you than to marry from back home. So I'm personally a fan of getting married here. If, now, if a person has exhausted all means and cannot find a spouse here, and then they choose to get married back home, that's fine. But I don't think that should be, I think it, it would be priority to look for someone that's been raised in the same cultural context. All right? Um, the other, the other question, which is one that I would rant a lot about, um, I'm trying to, to word it in a way that it's concise and I don't go on a, on a, on a rant, but uh, there are many, all the different costs that are associated with weddings today, with marriages today, it's just terrible. So it starts with the dowry, right? The dowry, which is meant to be a gift that symbolizes the marriage contract, that the woman is supposed to request, just as a gift, to symbolize the contract. It can be tangible in its nature, so it could be something small, it could be a ring, it could be, it could be a bouquet of flowers, it could be, or it could be a recitation of Quran, or something that's just no more it's mentioned. Right? The dowry could be all of those things. The parents are supposed to have absolutely nothing to do with that. Okay? The dowry, and, and subhanAllah, the way, if you look at the maqasid, the, what our deen was, you know, tr the intent of our deen. The woman is supposed to request something small. The Prophet said the best dowry is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the smallest one. And the man from his kindness is supposed to increase it. So, if a woman says, you know, I just, you know, I'll, I'll just take, I'll take this thing, right? I'll take this. this. This is good enough for me as a gift. Just to symbolize the contract. So, to start ihsan in the marriage already, the man can come back and say, no, I'm going to give you that and more. I just want to give you more. Just to, just to encourage, just to encourage a good relationship. It's 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 symbolic in its nature. It's meant to be symbolic. It's in no way, shape, or form a price tag. All right. We're not because if that was the case, then we'd say that Fatima will be Allah and the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the queen. And Subhanallah, look, she's the queen of the women women of Jannah. And her dowry, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi had to fetch a shield for Ali Allah because he had nothing to marry her with. He had no dowry, no gift to give. <coughs> 
the father-in-law had to give him a gift to give to his own daughter just to symbolize that marriage. So there is no woman in the world that's more valuable than Fatima So it's not, you know, and I hate to use this word, but 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 I'm being real. It, it's it's almost become like prostitution in a way. It's terrible. All right, it's like you put a really really high price. Like what? Are you selling your daughter? Right? Are you selling yourself? What are you talking about? You know, so those lavish things, and it's also not an insurance plan, so that the husband can never divorce you or something like that, because because it's due, you know, it's due, uh, especially the mu'akhad, right, or the, the concept, and, and the asad of, of the dowry, the, dif, the default of the dowry, is that it's due sometime over the marriage, unless it's stipulated as being immediate, according to the correct opinion, right, but when someone, like, puts, like, a really, really high mu'akhad, so that you can't divorce me, if you divorce me, you're going to... That's Pamla, the type of person that would agree to that type of marriage. He's not going to care anyway. So when he breaks the contract, he's going to be like, whatever, I don't have to give you anything. Right? So that's one thing. And then the wedding costs. Simplicity in our weddings. SubhanAllah, like, this is something that's encouraged in the faith. You don't want to start your marriage in debt. You don't want to start your marriage with haram, with, with, with an impermissible wedding festivity. You don't want to start your marriage with that. Okay? And in particular, SubhanAllah, just... You look at the weddings from a Sunnah perspective, the way that they're meant to be, it's so easy, right? You know, two people get together, they have a small, moderate feast, or if they can afford more, they, they have a feast, right? They feed many people to, you know, they announce their, you know, their congrat, whatever, whatever, they announce their marriage, whatever it is, right? So go on Facebook, make it Facebook official, you know, whatever it is that you gotta do, come to that, we're married, everybody celebrate with us, you know, that kind of stuff. It is absolutely not meant to be, to, to drown you, to, to start off with israf, to start off with wastefulness and extravagance. You know, I tell people this, I don't care if your wedding is 100% halal in the way that it's carried out. How are you going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and explain to him how you just blew $60,000 for one night? How are you going to meet Allah and explain that to him? With everything that we go through, with everything, with all the problems in the world. Right? So, I, I'm just... Yeah, not a fan of them at all. Who is the question? Brother, yes. Um, my question is um, about MSAs, because I know most of us here are involved in MSAs or something like that. Um, MSA National posted a, a status today on Facebook about is the MSA a hookup place? And they give, they give um, I mean, the, the article is, is, is pretty extensive. It talks a lot about this issue. Um, I'm personally involved with the MSA, and there's a lot of, you know, meetings and interactions that you that you have to have at some point with the opposite gender, especially when you want to have events like this, you know, community service and all that kind of stuff. Um, but on the other hand, they quoted an ayah. I mean, they, they posted an ayah on there which says that the men and the women, the believing men and women are awliya one another, right? Are helpers and supporters. Okay. I think that is to justify that you can have, you know, meetings and stuff together like that. I'm not sure. But on, and another brother quotes an hadith. I remember a time we were about to have a meeting, an MSA meeting, and he brings an hadith and says that says the Prophet cursed the gathering of men and women. And we we almost did not have that meeting at that point just because of what he I mean he was more he was the one that looked more religious. Two extremes MSA. that you just mentioned. Yeah. So, are there any guidelines as to if, even if the MSA is a is a is a place to look for a spouse, right? Are there any like healthy guidelines that we can follow in order to make it? You know? Great question. Great question. All right. I want you guys to pay attention to this question. So, everybody heard the question? Yeah. Okay. So the idea of, of of you know MSAs being a platform for people getting together, marriage, those types of things. Now there are some very inappropriate relationships that do take place under the banner of, the, of not just an MSA, in fact, any Muslim organization. There are, there's no doubt about it. Um, so, you know, it becomes very, you know, inappropriate, there's flirt, you know, people become flirtatious, right, they play around with each other, I mean, there's, there's stuff that's very inappropriate that takes place under the banner of religiosity, unfortunately. You know, and, and there's no justification for that. And in fact, uh, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Nima Talbisul Haqqa bil You know, you're dressing truth with falsehood. Right? So you're dressing truth with falsehood. Like you mentioned the use of that ayah to justify such a thing. Which is something that people 
people uh, who follow their desires will do. They'll quote implicit evidence and ignore explicit evidence. Okay, so there's explicit <coughs> evidence to forbid, uh, you know, people becoming flirtatious, seclusion, being alone with each other, which would include cyber khalwa too, by the way, being alone with each other, even at, on, in an online version, you know, just being alone all the time, spending too much time. There's exclusive evidence to prohibit that. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I, I have seen some, some good marriages come out of, for example, and Maghrib volunteers, MSA volunteers, YM volunteers, where it's like, you know, there was a healthy working relationship in the sense that they both knew the other's purpose through the MSA. You, you know, you got to observe someone and their character and think of, things of that sort. It wasn't inappropriate, you just got to observe character. And, you know, that was, that was the, the launching pad uh, for what turned out to be a good marriage. So I've seen that happen also. And those can be very healthy and good marriages. So Islam is, is always, uh, it always lies in the middle. No, the gathering is not cursed, as long as the gathering observes the proper conditions. Okay? And, you know, if we seclude so much, uh, if, if, we, if we put a barrier that's, that is, you know, that, that, that is just, it's so dividing that Muslim men and Muslim women never interact with each other, then you're actually, you know, you're actually going to, that's actually going to result in a greater harm. Okay, so it's, it's between this and between that. But, but again, and this is again, your personal tough one. When you work in an MSA, it's very hard because it look, you know, it's a religious gathering. Everybody's hanging out, everybody else is having a good time. But you have to have the tough one to hold yourself back. So you know what, no, this isn't, this isn't appropriate. This is going too far. But at the same time, the, the other side is also extremism. And extremism should not always be associated with, re with religion. In fact, it should not be associated with religion at all. Especially in that situation. <laughs>